Good afternoon, everybody. I thought I'd talk about a topic that's a favorite of mine. This is sort of the wrong audience because you know all about innovation. But I thought I'd give you my perspective. Uh, first, many of you are unreasonable and as varied a set of people as George Bernard Shaw and uh, Martin Luther King agree that human salvation lie, lies in the hands of the creatively maladjusted. Um, the thing that strikes me very much is this quote of all people from Karl Marx, because punditry is all about extrapolating the past. It's what happened last week is going to happen next week. It's pretty good weather forecasting tool, but misses at all the important points. So let me give you my view of experts and pundits. My favorite is a 1986 study that McKinsey did for AT&T about the number of cell phones in the United States in the year 2000. They were looking 15 years out, and they forecast just under a million phones. They were, of course, off by 10,000%. There were 109 million phones. AT&T paid millions of dollars and then got rid of their cell phone business based on this forecast. That is punditry at its essence. But it's worth looking at why. The 1980s cell phone in 86 looked something like this. Most of you are probably too young to remember. They were floor mounted on your car. They had handset cords. The phone by the year 2000 was smaller than the handset cord on the phone from the 19 mid-80s. Of course, there's the iPhone. But if I sat in 1986 and told you that processors would run fast enough to have the Motorola Star Trek, Star Trek in the year 2000, just 15 years hence, the batteries would last and all the electronics would consume so little power or there'd be so much bandwidth, you'd have locked me out of the room. It is technology changes which are curves in that train that make the intellectuals and the pundits fall off. My favorite is a study by Professor Tetlock at Berkeley, who followed 250 experts for 20 years and 80,000 forecasts. Guess what? The average accuracy of those experts is about the same as dart throwing monkeys. This is honest to goodness, rigorous statistical data. For those of you who are interested, it's a book called Expert Political Judgment. Unless you're a true statistics nerd, you won't get through it. But it's worth reading. I did manage to struggle through it. So on the other side is this tweet I saw. Cynics are great. But Hope is the only path to extraordinary success. You don't do unreasonable things by being reasonable. Now, a tweet we know didn't exist five years ago. Now there's 100 million users, 65 million tweets posted each day. If you had defined this, what would McKinsey have forecast? Or Booz Allen are your favorite pundit. I loved watching the San Francisco Giants win the World Series. We've got to give a shout out, shout out for that, too. But what's fun was that night watching the tweets. Uh, there was a riot on Foursquare in Twitter. Somebody was asking how you set an electric car on fire. <laughs> uh, somebody else was sending tweet pics uh, of them eating meat to PETA. How could you have imagined something? Oh, this is my other favorite one. In, in the year 2000, I did a seminar on telecommunications for McKinsey in India, trying to tell them that they shouldn't invest in landlines, that voice over IP and mobile would be the center. Today, there's 630 million cell phones in India and only 300 million or so people have access to toilets and lat latrines. That is the nature of innovation. 
And I asked myself, which pundit could have predicted any of these? That you could assess culture of a city from a bunch of 140 character tweets. And there's so much there. There's mood of the nation. There's all kinds of things buried in tweets. No tweet, uh, no innovation ever comes from the big guys. Almost always, and I love GE because their symbol is the light bulb, and they think lighting is one of their areas. So, I won't read through all these in the interest of time. But what I love about innovators is a whole different attitude. It's what one researcher called effectual reasoning. You don't worry about where the world's going to go. You sort of say, what do you have around you, and what can you do with it? And then you figure out the path. And the most successful internet startups couldn't have defined where they'd get to, even a year or two before they got there. I saw this list of great innovation and great innovating, most innovating companies on Business Week and Fast Company. And I asked myself the question, other than maybe Apple, what has surprised me from these companies? And the answer was very little. So again, the press lumped them in with the pundits. They don't have a clue until after the fact. The other thing which I really like, which makes what you, all of you are doing, or many of you are doing, interesting, is we live in an economy that's a winner-take-all economy. Often an industry looks like the one on the left. And by the way, I first put this chart together in 1986 about the software industry. There was lots of little companies with lots of little market cap. And then you got the one on the right with Microsoft and Adobe and a few others. The same thing happened in the dot-com thing. And the same thing will happen in whatever new area we invent, uh, whether it's social media or whatever comes after that. Um, you may have seen this slide from Mary Meeker. Uh, I promised her I'd give full attribution. Uh, she gave me a 20 cent discount for saying that. Uh, but it is hard to imagine more devices than people, but it's very likely. Um, and I'll talk about some of that. In every generation, We've seen radical shifts. I remember when we were starting Sun, we were criticized for having a minimum memory size of a megabyte or making networking standard on every computer. So almost certainly, the next big thing won't come from Google or Facebook or Yahoo or Twitter. Apple's an interesting case, and we can come back and talk about it. But as surely as you couldn't imagine a PC in every home, one of our competitors at Sun, Ken Olson, CEO of DEC, said that in 1985. You couldn't imagine email in 1990. I got laughed at one evening when I went to New York for dinner with my business school buddies and had my email address in the late 80s on my business card. Um, you couldn't imagine the internet in 1995, just when the browser was introduced. And every big company I talked to thought that pay-per-view movies was what interactive TV was about. Um, so um, even in the year 2000, when Google was just a year or two old, search was hard to imagine being important. In fact, the funny story goes, and this is in John Battelle's book, I actually tried to convince Excite, where I was on the board, to, uh, uh, to buy Google and negotiate a deal with Larry and Sergey for uh, just about a million bucks. And Larry and Sergey were happy to sell, but uh, the Excite guys didn't want to buy. I tried about five times, which was good, because we got to invest in it when I was at Kleiner Perkins, so that was great. Uh, people forget 
January of 07 was when the, uh, January 1 of 07, the iPhone didn't exist. Now it's conventional wisdom. And of course, my favorite is in two mid-2008, you couldn't talk about Goldman and uh, Morgan Stanley going bankrupt. So change does happen, which is good news for all of us. Today, what we are seeing is existing static products going into the iPhone, iPad, iP Android ecosystem. But the most interesting thing is the explosion yet to come. And, and that's where almost none of the forecasts that you read about as important trends are likely to be true. So what will it be? Taste graph, privacy, I, you can pick your favorite. Um, all sorts of new tools, like HTML5, will enable new sorts of capability. Almost certainly, the most interesting companies will be at least as surprising, if not more surprising, than Twitter. There's plenty of areas that are far from addressed, and I'm sure many of the entrepreneurs here are addressing these areas. Um, some of these are motherhood and apple pie. Others are largely ignored. Um, so for those of you who get discouraged when you come up with those largely ignored ideas, let me suggest that the difference between delusional and visionary is mostly retrospective. You know, if, if you had a few years ago talked about 140 character messages as being critical or influencing the Iranian revolution, you'd have been called delusional. Attitude matters. Uh, this is uh, from my energy investing. Um, Ecomotors is a company that was trying to do something that most automotive engineers said couldn't be done. Um, so I sent, let, sent this email to the founder, said, these guys say it can't be done, and he sent me this response of everyone told him what else he couldn't do. That was all I needed, and we invested in the company. Attitude and irreverence is absolutely key to, to ignorance, uh, to innovation. Uh, also, ignoring the likelihood of failure is key. My favorite is Robert F. Kennedy's quote that only who dare fail greatly can achieve greatly. I personally like to say my willingness to fail gives me the ability to succeed. So let me try and finish up by saying, in fact, the rate of change will accelerate. Adaptability is going to be the key. And, and, and frankly, if you take the attitude that even when you fail, it's a lot of fun, um, and you learn a lot, heck, why would you ever keep a job at a big company? Uh, so those of you who want new jobs, uh, send me an email. Uh, I want to end with Alan Kay's quote, really, to predict the future, you really have to invent it. Stop looking at others. Stop chasing Facebook. Stop looking at the pundits. Stop reading those research reports. None of that is relevant to true innovation. Um, and frankly, if you have a hunch, that's usually good enough. Thank you all very much.